Hello, everyone. This is a quick sound check. Uh, just feel free to raise your hand to make sure everyone can hear me um, or just put a uh, message in the question box. That'd be great. Thank you. We'll begin shortly here. We're just waiting for a few more attendees to arrive. Um, and welcome. Great, I see some hand raised there. It looks like uh, we have some, everyone can hear me all right. So this is good, this is good. Once again, we'll wait a couple minutes here just to get going. Thank you for attending. Hello, welcome everyone. Uh, feel free uh, to ask any questions during this presentation at any point. Um, all the questions will be addressed at the end of the webinar. And once again, I'll just wait a couple minutes here just for a few more attendees to join us. Um, and then we will uh, get going with our Servo Made Simple webinar. Once again, welcome everyone to today's webinar. My name is Thomas, and I'm one of the applications engineers here at Unitronics. And today we're going to be discussing our Servo Made Simple solution. Over the years, uh, Unitronics has developed their product line drastically. Uh, we have now added motion control in the terms of VFDs and Servo AC Servo Moto Drive. And today I'm going to go over the challenges uh, that some of the challenges that we faced, uh, you know, integrating servos um, and how it, Unitronics has developed uh, their application, the Unilogic and Visilogic environment to cater to end users and programmers to easily implement servo solutions in their system. Today we're going to cover uh, the servo motion control solution. And we're going to cover how Unitronics implemented the servo into their PLC plus HMI programming platform. And this particular presentation will be covering Unilog. We're going to go over the, the advantages of the servo solution. 
We're going to also go over a quick demonstration of the software and how easy it is to program and incorporate the servos in your application. And last but not least, we'll, be able, we'll demonstrate a simple example with uh, simple commands of the drive and motor, position commands, stop commands, etc. To start off this morning, we're going to go ahead and uh, start off with a quick presentation here. Some of the common servo challenges that are faced in every day in the industry, Unitronics decided that they were going to tackle this head on. Um, our R&D team uh, got together um, and they felt that they could develop an application and a solution that caters to programmers uh, to ease the integration of servos into their mechanical systems. There are many, excuse me, there are many levels of complexity when it comes to motion related projects such as mechanical, electrical, communication and control, and system integration, as seen to the right. So our R&D team wanted to simplify the system design, simplify servo configuration and tuning, the communication implementation, the field bus. So we wanted to ease all of that, plus the HMI and the logic development in our application. And that was our main question, is how can we simplify this for our, for our customers? So our R&D team has worked, you know, day in and day out to provide us with a, a logical solution. Let's touch base about a little bit about the Unitronics system architecture. In, in this particular presentation, we'll be covering the Unistream. So now we've become a one integrated control solution for automation. We provide PLC plus HMI. We provide AC servo drives and motors. We provide VFDs of various sizes. We also have local and remote IO. And the Unistream line is our bread and butter. Um, it is our mainstream line. Um, and that's, you know, the primary focus of this presentation today. If you look at the architecture to the left here, you notice that the Unistream is the center PLC um, that's being used for this demonstration. You notice that the Unistream PLC supports two uh, major protocols, it supports EtherCAT. Currently, the Unistream PLC, USC, is the only PLC that supports EtherCAT at the moment. Currently, the Unistream built-in and the built-in and the Unistream modular is not supported just yet. You notice that the Unistream PLC is connected to the PC. So we have a lot of abilities there. Um, we have the UniCloud, which is our, our new cloud platform that we've launched uh, to simplify uh, you know, gathering data um, and acquiring information in a centralized location. If you haven't checked out the UniClyde, I definitely recommend you do. And you can see to the right here, we have our uh, servo drives and motors. We have two series of drives. We have the EtherCAT and the CanOpen. And the way Unitronic to simplify this is that they provided an application where you can program both the EtherCAT and CanOpen using the same function blocks. So there's no level of complexity or differences uh, in terms of you know, developing your application, your function blocks, and your ladder code between EtherCAT and CanOpen, which is great. It's, it, you know, cuts down, um, you know, integration time, programming time, and allows for the end user to simply, you know, switch whether they're using EtherCAT or CanOpen drives. Simplifying motion control. Everyone claims that, you know, they provide the simple uh, motion control platform. And we were, and then Unitronics had to come up with questions on how we can differ from ourselves. Like how does Unitronics simplify the server integration? How does Unitronics differ from other competitors? Why Unitronics server solution? These are all great questions that I'm gonna present you in the next slide. <clears throat> Software differences. If you notice to the left, these are some of our competitors. Um, they have, you know, several different software packages 
required for their integration platform. Um, some softwares might be specifically just for IO uh, or HMIs or data collection or anything else that, you know, might be in the automation industry. Unitronics though provides an all-in-one software that allows you to design your application, design your HMI screens, develop ladder logic, and also program your servo motors. And that right there makes us stand out because this software package is available to you at no cost. So you can download our applications tonight, play around with our function blocks and take a look and see if you can get comfortable with the software. I'd highly recommend it. As I mentioned, we've simplified the ladder logic significantly. Uh, you notice to the left, some of our competitors um, require communication integration. So this requires you to build the messages, the read and write commands to the servo drive and motor. However, if you look to the right, Unitronics actually has developed you know, drag and drop application, excuse me, drag and drop ladder logic <clears throat> that can be added directly into the application. So there's no need to uh, define byte structures of messages and data, as you can see to the left. We have these nice function blocks that are quickly drag and drop right in the software. To continue our MC motion control function blocks, you notice that in some of our competitor software to the left again, once again, um, you'll notice that you know there's different levels and folders that need to be created uh, for the function blocks being used. It looks like they need uh, many input parameters to get the function block to work. And what Unitronics did is created these function blocks that allow for users to drop directly into the application. And you notice underneath the Unitronics function block there that it says the PLC, uh, the PLC open base function block. And that's exactly what we've done. We've implemented the PLC open, which is an open protocol for PLC communications to servos and implement that directly into our Unilogic software. Um, currently, um, the PLC open only operates with our server, servos and drives. Next up is the mechanical implementation. So you notice to the left, many of our competitors have created um, you know, other software packages that require a lot of math, um, whether it's uh, understanding the torque, inertia, uh, and other things like that. Our software um, allows you to add the mechanical properties, um, and then it, it'll automatically do the unit conversion for you. So for example, you notice the, the mechanical properties tool to the right. You can see our motors to the left, followed up by a gearbox, which looks like a gearbox there, and followed by a belt and pulley, and then ending with a linear actuator. Once you add the linear actuator, you notice in the bottom right-hand corner, it's a little small, um, but the units, you can, you can define the units that you're gonna work with, whether it's inches, millimeters, centimeters, et cetera. Once you defined the mechanical properties of your system, you can actually now work in those units moving forward. So velocity moves will be, you know, in millimeters per second. Acceleration, deceleration will be millimeters per second squared. So this, this, this is how Unitronic stands out. We've took that complex math, masked it in a way to allow for easy programming and easy implementation with our software. Also built into the software is our diagnostics tool. We can get real-time data being pulled directly from the drive and analyze it for any type of errors. And it just allows for easy and fast integration, getting straight to the point and understanding what issues are coming up with the actual drive. <clears throat> the diagnostics tool is amazing. It allows you to read the current values off the drive and you'll see the configured values to the right. So it allows you to compare and contrast and really get to the bottom of why a certain movement isn't getting to the point or is it not fast enough. So it allows for the user to really get 
into the servo and understand how it's operating each move. You notice there is a diagnostic trace. Um, it's, we're, we're actually going to demonstrate this later on once we uh, demonstrate the application. But this allows you to read um, real-time values from the drive um, directly into the Unilogic software without any additional programming. Um, once you, know, you define your access and we get connected, you can actually monitor in real time, which we'll do um, at the end of the example. And this, and this strong tool allows you to really analyze all your movements and really understand and why it's causing an error. Uh, you notice to the left, there's a lot of noise going on. Um, and once they actually fine tuned it, moves were a lot more controlled to the right. And this is the strong um, tool that you, that you could use um, on your own and just really get comfortable. Um, and this is all part of the Unilogic software. As I mentioned, this is readily available to you. Um, so feel free to download that uh, today and play around with it. Here's another screen. Um, also from the diagnostics tool, it allows you to follow you know, any errors that you may be having, um, see the target position there. Um, and each position is getting to the actual uh, position needed. Um, and there's just other, just, you know, just another strong tool that's avail readily available in our unified software. Next up, we're going to add a servo drive to the Unilogic project. So what we're going to do next is we're going to open up a new application in, in, the, in the Unilogic software. We're going to select the model, uh, the select the Unistream model that we're using. We're going to add a COM module if needed. So if we're going to use the EtherCAT, we would certainly need an EtherCAT COM module. If we were working with a CAN open drive, we would need a CAN bus port if it's not currently in on the PLC. We're going to define an axis with the mechanical properties. So we're going to teach the servo drive our mechanical system so we can work in the units that we need. And we're going to co quickly cover the ladder toolbox, all the MC motion control function blocks that we have available, just to show you where it is, how to navigate the software a little bit. So let me go ahead and open up Unilogic now. I'm going to go ahead and open up a new application here. I'm going to call this Servo Webinar Four Twenty Six. I'm going to hit Next to start a new application. And now I'm going to go ahead and select the PLC that I'm using. Currently, I'm going to go ahead and select under the model family. I'm going to go ahead and select the Unistream PLC. It's currently the PLC that I'm using. I'm going to navigate to the type of PLC. So I have a B5 and it's a B1 with no IO. To the right, you'll see the PLC that I've selected. I've selected the USC, the B5, B1. And it comes with two built in ports, two Ethernet ports a USB host, and one USB mini USB for programming. I'm going to go ahead and click Finish. Once I have the project opened up now, my PLC is currently in the middle. I have my B5, my Unisheen B5. Now I'm going to go ahead and add my COM modules, depending on which PL, which uh, series drive that I'm using. As I mentioned before, programming EtherCAT and CanOpen are exactly the same. So in terms of programming and access control and access to find, they are exactly the same. They're actually interchangeable. So I'm going to go ahead and add my new Unicom here. So I'm going to navigate to the Pollution Explorer to the left. My current uh, controller model here, the USC-B5-B1. 
And I'm going to go ahead and add my local UniIO and COM. I'm going to navigate to the toolbox. And I'm going to select the UAC01 EC2. This is our Ethercat COM module. Notice how it connects to the right side of the PLC. And if I was using a CAN open drive, I would have had a CAN card to the P application. It's a UAC-CB-01CAN, and this is the CAN bus module. And notice that it actually connects to the left side of the PC PLC versus the UAC, Ethercat module. Once I added the COM module needed for my application, I'm going to go ahead and navigate back to my Solution Explorer to the left, and I'm going to click on Motion Drives, Servo, Servo Drives. Once I click on Servo Drives, my toolbox populates with my only two options available, which is very nice. The software is very intuitive and knows that, hey, now I'm only selecting uh, a drive and populates the toolbox accordingly. So I'm going to go ahead and click on the drive here. So if I added a drive, if I added an Ethercat drive here, the UMD-E3, the drive is now added to the application. <clears throat> now in the bottom right-hand corner of the properties window, I can select the actual motor that I'm using. This is very important for feedback control and all the math uh, that is done for the access. So it's very important that we select the proper motor series and the motor that we have for the application. Currently, I'm going to be using a B4 series motor. And if I go down here, it's actually a 400 watt. So currently, I'm using a UMM-004BN Bravo Nancy-B4. In this, in this is a B4 series motor. With It's an incremental, noted by the end here. And there's not a secondary B, so there's no break. So currently, this application is with a 400-watt incremental feedback motor with no break. If I were to add a second drive, you notice that the... Uh, my second drive is now a CAN open drive, and I set the CAN open ID, which is important for the CAN bus network, um, as the CAN bus, that CAN open ID is the indicator for um, the node on the CAN bus network. And I'm going to go ahead and select this motor as well. So I'm also using a B4 CAN open motor, and I'm going to select a 100 watt motor. To UMM 001 BA B4. So, this is a absolute feedback encoder. Notice that the properties for the actual motor populates below. So, I have a 23 bit resolution. This is roughly 8,388,000 points. So, it's about 8,300,000 roughly of points of accuracy for each rotation of the motor. Slightly different from my first drive, I selected a incremental encoder, and this was actually uh, an encoder resolution of 20 bits. So this is roughly slightly over a million points of accuracy for, um, for that. But it populates my, my rated current, my peak torque, rated speed, and everything populates directly into the software for calculations. So now I'm going to navigate to servo configuration. So if I was going to add a servo configuration for the Ethercat motor, notice here that it adds my server model here. And notice I have a configuration here. The configuration file saves directly to the PLC. There's no need to save it to any external storage. This saves it directly to the memory PLC. So you can reference this configuration if needed. 
you'll notice here there's you know many 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 parameters on the drive to choose from to you know from manual tuning you know acceleration deceleration speeds torque limits max limits everything possible and available on the drive is available to you here in the configuration so for example if i wanted to um, set up limit switches i can go to parameter five go to my pn509 and I can set this to a input that I need. For example, home reference. Maybe the input on my CN1 connector for input 14 is my home reference switch. So now that I have altered this parameter, we can now navigate to the modified parameters. And you'll notice that the input selection is now modified from the default values. This is a nice way if you just wanted to write your modified parameters, you can. Or if you wanted to write the entire configuration, you can also do so as well. R&D even came up with, you know, a fast configuration base, you know, for typical parameters on the drive that users tend to use more often. So these are the fast configurations that we can quickly assign or make changes to if needed. So, you know, R&D made it, you know, wanted to make this user experience as easy as possible. And I feel like they've done that with a lot of work and effort they put over the years. Each parameter will have a brief description if needed, which helps understand exactly what's happening and what this parameter actually means. Next, I'm gonna navigate back into my Solution Explorer to the left. And what I wanna click on is motion click on axis and I'm going to add a new axis to my application. You'll be prompted uh, by a pop-up that's asked you if you want to import the ready-made solution. The ready-made solution is a click and drag function block that allows an entire diagnostics tool to run. Uh, we've covered this in a previous uh, webinar. We can, I'll, you know, I'll be happy to sing that webinar at the end of this. Um, it looks like here we do have a question in the box. It looks like, yes, this, um, this webinar will be sent to everyone. Uh, don't worry. Um, if I'm moving too fast, it's just, you know, this is just, just a quick overview. Um, if you have any questions, any, you know, direct questions or anything, feel free to put them in the box. Don't hesitate um, to ask any questions on the fly, just so you don't forget anything. Um, yeah, but just get back to it here. So, you know, this is the ready-made all-in-one solution. There's a video tutorial as well link to help you understand the diagnostic apps. But for right now, we just wanna show you how easy the function blocks are. So we're gonna develop our own little application here. So I'm gonna skip the import for now. So now I can define the axis. Notice here that the axis, I can link to either the can open or the eat the cat drive. This allows for easily interchange between, you know, say if you have an Ethercat network and you decide to move over to Can Open, you won't need to do any additional programming. You won't need to change any of your program. Um, you just need to define, you know, the drive that you're using and use all the same function blocks as you did before. So I'm gonna go ahead and link, for this example, I'm gonna link my Can Open drive. And now I'm gonna click on the axis. The axis is very important. The axis allows us to define the mechanical properties of the system. And what that does inherently allows the software to do all that difficult math for you. So it'll handle all the pulses to the motor for precise motion control. In the example, I'm gonna be rotating this motor on a rotary actuator. So I'm going to add a rotary actuator to the application. Notice that all the property window now populates in the bottom right-hand corner here with my linear actuator. So currently, uh, for every one motor revolution, I'm traveling 360 degrees, which is accurate, given the properties that I have established here. I can set the max input torque 
of, so these are all properties of this linear actuator. So for example, if I had a max input torque of 6,000 Newton meters, I would add that to this properties window. All right, so example, if I wanted to add, say my mechanical system actually required a gearbox, uh, so I have a three to one gearbox here. So for every, for every motor revolution is one travel revolution of one rev. So it takes three rev, uh, motor revolutions for one travel distance. But watch what happens to the units once I add a linear actuator. So now for every three motor, uh, three motor revolutions, I'm traveling one millimeter. So now I'm working in millimeters um, directly. So when programming, I can refer to the units as millimeters per second, millimeters per second squared, and so forth. And <clears throat> I can add properties to my linear actuator here as well. So for every, maybe I travel 300 millimeters for every five motor revolutions. Given my three to one gearbox ratio here, so now I move 15 motor revolutions to actually move 300 millimeters. So I also set the max speed here and this, I'll set this to 70,000 units per second. And the max input torque is also 70,000, 7,000 Newton meters. The max stroke units is one. So as of right now, I'm traveling everything. Everything is going to be working in millimeters per second. So if I scroll down here, you notice that, you know, the dynamics, um, you notice that here, my motion, I can select the motion profile. I can select whether it's a trapezoidal move or an S curve. I can set the maximum acceleration deceleration. Notice that everything is now in millimeters per second, given how I've defined my axis. I can set, um, I can enable software limits here. So here I can set the positive limits, the negative limits. So then um, the motor won't go past this negative limit or this positive limit if needed. So these are all sophomore base limits. And here's where you can kind of fine tune your movements. You can set the maximum position error. So you would probably want a smaller position there than a hundred millimeters, um, just because we can. Um, we have a high resolution. We have a three to one gearbox ratio, gear reduction that allows us for precise movements. So we can lower this down to say five millimeters of position error. You can also adjust the maximum position error time here, the in position tolerance, the maximum velocity, et cetera. And that's how simple you define your axis. Once you define your axis, you've taught the servo drive, the mechanical properties of the system. And now this allows you to enter the units as needed as the engineer. So as the engineer, um, this will bridge the gap between the mechanical, the software, and the electrical engineer. This allows, this incumbents those three um, engineering practices into one. So it handles all the mechanical properties and the physics it also handles the, the pulses that's going to be the electrical pulses that it's sending to the motor to control the axis. And then the software base is, you know, the programming environment that we have in front of us. This strong tool, Unilogic, allows us to control and program our drives. So now, now that I've, we defined an axis and now um, we've you know, taught the drive, the mechanical property of the system. Next, let's jump into the ladder logic, just to show you how easy and simple it is to set up ladder logic communications to the drive. I'm gonna to navigate to the loose solution explorer to the left. I'm gonna click on my ladder logic here, function one. I'm gonna minimize my solution explorer here just for um, organizational purposes. So now I'm currently in the ladder logic and now I'm working with, you know, ladder elements in the toolbox. So I have my basic elements here, direct contacts, inverted contacts, 
positive transition. I'm going to navigate down to motion control. <clears throat> motion control, and here are some of the function blocks that we discussed in the previous presentation. We have various, you know, PLC open base function blocks under motion control. We have MC power, MC home, MC stop, absolute move, relative moves, additive moves, velocity moves. We also have torque control, apply force, and so forth. It's quite simple to create ladder logic to the drive. So I'm going to go ahead and grab one, for example, here to show you how simple it is. I'm going to click and drag. Notice how this the application drags my app function blocks directly into the ladder logic. I'm going to zoom in a little bit to help everyone there. And this is my MC power function block. Notice that I need three input parameters here. At the very top is the struct. This is the struct of information that we're going to be sending um, to the drive. This is very important that each function block has its own struct linked to it as the data block of information that being sent to the drive. So I'm going to add a new struct here. It gives me the type for MC power. I'm going to call this my axis one power. Click save. You notice now that a struct has been added to this, uh, to this application here. If I go ahead and click on MC power, you notice that there's a struct here and it tells me wh whether, you know, the status, whether or not, you know, this is valid. We have error, error ID, and the enable bit. Very similarly to the actual function block itself. You can hover over the parameters to know exactly what it's looking for. So parameter A is looking for the axis. We only have one axis defined, you know, with the linear actuator. I'm going to go ahead and click that. And then this is the enable bit. So MC the MC power function block will initiate control over the axis. So as long as this bit is on, the PLC will have control over the axis. So I'm going to go ahead and link that. I'm going to create a new bit here. Enable bit and save. And that's how quickly it is I can add a function block to control the motor. So this MC power is the initial connection, initial uh, the initial you know, connection to the drive from the PLC. It's just the broadcast message like, hey, I currently have uh, control over this axis. Next, I'm going to grab a, another function block, for example, MC stop. So this function block, when it's triggered, it's going to stop the PLC in its tracks. So whether it's in the middle of a move or an emergency condition happens, you can trigger the MC stop for that. Similarly to the Axis 1 power, I'm going to add a new struct here by clicking on the blue pencil in the software. Notice that the type is MC stop, so it's going to make another data block for my stop command. I'm going to call this Axis one stop. I'm going to hit save. Notice that I have another struct here of information that's added now. I have MC power, MC stop. If I open up that struct, I have a done bit that I can use, a busy, command aborted, error ID. Execute jerk factor only applies if you're using S curve uh, profiles only. We're currently using trapezoidal, so it can be uh, left out for now. So now, similarly to the MC power, you can hover over the input parameters on the function block. So A parameter is looking for access. I'm going to link access one once again. And this is the execute. So as, as soon as this bit is on, it's going to stop the drive in its tracks. So I'm going to call this my stop bit. 
here. And the third is going to be a hover over it. This is jerk. And this is only irrelevant if the axis profile is set to X curve. So we can set this to, I'm going to just set this to a hard coded value of 100 just for now, just for example purposes. And notice here, um, didn't cover this in the previous one, but these are also, these are outputs for this function block. Notice how this function block here, I have a done bit, I have a busy bit. So you can actually link your own tags to these bits. So you can use this done bit, you know, to trigger other function blocks, maybe a sequence of function blocks. So once, you know, one um, move is done or one stop command is done, you can then trigger a secondary move or a secondary move trigger. Do we have busy bits? And these are things that you can tie directly to the function block. One thing to add here, notice how the function block is directly on the rail. These, the, con the constant communication is going to happen. You know, you want constant communication to the drive at all times and then execute the bit that's needed for the function block. So whether it's the stop bit, whether it's the enable bit, these are the controlling factors of this function block. So I'm going to go ahead and add one more function block here. For example, I'm going to use a move relative, which is going to, we're going to use in our other example. Quickly just show you here, if I set up another M, uh, struct for the MC relative, I'm going to call this axis one relative move. <clears throat> Notice here that the struct now populates down below. And similarly to the other function blocks, there's input parameters and output parameters for this function block. Once again, similar to the other ones, they're on the power rail, so constantly getting power. And it's all only looking for the execute bit to execute that command when needed. Access to, once again, it's acting me for the only thing available here. This is access, only have one access to find. One access here, so I'm gonna act, link my access once again. Here, I have another execute, so I can link another bit here. Access one, absolute move, so I linked another bit. So I can use this bit in my HMI to trigger these moves and everything. So you, you can continue here, so you can actually, you know, have this be continuously updated, which you can actually link a bit to. Um, you know, an actual bit so you can control it within the logic instead of, you know, a hard coded zero. So a hard coded zero would be no continuous update. But if you wanted to continuously update, you know, the relative position continuously, I would set this to one. The input parameters is distance. So, you know, we've been working in millimeters because uh, that's how we defined our axis, at least this particular application. So if we wanted to move 6,000 millimeters, we would enter a value of 6,000 in here. And then now we've taught the UMD drive, you know, the distance and the mechanical properties. And now we're working in millimeters. So we can set the position directly here in millimeters and the drive will execute the move accordingly. We also have velocity. You can set, set the velocity here. You can also link a tag. This does not have to be a hard coded value. This could be uh, a tag that you're manipulating in the software um, for this relative move. Similarly to the other function blocks, their output parameters to here, their ID, the error bit, whether or not the command was aborted. These are all that you can use for error, error logging, um, and checking if a move is completed before the next one. It's just nice tools to have um, to set up. And that's how quickly it is to link these MC uh, ladder logic directly into your application. Next up, I want to show you uh, a quick, simple application. Um, and I have a server motor drive here that I'm going to connect to and make some movements. And I just want to show you how e easy it is to set up a simple application just for some simple moves using our function blocks. I'm going to go ahead and open up the project here. The software here allows me to drag and drop 
So I can place this, my HMI screen here to the left and my ladder logic to the right. You notice I have similar in the other application, I have an MC power, which I enable with a button on screen. Here I have two, just undo me. Here, here I have two MC reads as the execute bit is generally on. So this is a bit is always on. So I'm constantly reading the position in the torque. And I'm using this information and populating it on my HMI screen in the top right hand corner. The velocity is automatically read from the drive. So you only have to read the position in the torque read. And then I linked another, notice that they're all on the rail. Once again, I've linked the drive reset link to this button here. I've also linked a MC stop link to this button here. So this stop bit here is linked here. And I'll also have a relative move. I've placed uh, my position to move to, my acceleration, my deceleration, and move velocity, which are all input parameters to this function block directly on the HMI screen. I'm going to go online right now with this application. I also have a VNC connection. So this is the current PLC on my desk. I'm connected to a 400 watt motor with an incremental encoder feedback. Let's take a look at the ladder logic here. So notice here, I'm going to scroll up to the top. If I want to enable the drive, notice that my bit is now on, and now you can see the torque fluctuates slightly. I'm going to go ahead and change this position. Instead of 20,000, I want to move 3,000 degrees at acceleration of 6,000 degrees per second squared and a velocity of 5,000 degrees per second. So now I'm going to execute this move. Notice that my position is updating. My velocity is maintaining close to 5,000. And once I get to my position, the servo then holds that position as required. I can go ahead and hit home to home my PLC. So now my position is down to zero. Next up, I'm going to show you the diagnostics tool quickly here, just so we can see the motion profile. I'm going to go ahead and click on diagnostic trace here. I'm going to select my current axis that I have control over, and I'm going to start the diagnostics. Currently, my axis stayed at a standstill. I'm going to start recording my position. So right now, I'm using the, uni the Unilogic software to track my position. This is the live feedback that we're getting back from the drive directly. <clears throat> so now, I'm going to just show you how cool this feature is. So I'm going to go ahead and make a relative move. I'm currently at position zero, so I'm going to go ahead and make a move. My drive is currently getting to that position. Once my axis reaches 3,000, I'm currently now in 3,000 degrees. So now if I go ahead and home this, notice I go back to position zero. I'm going to go ahead and move again to 3,000 again. This time I'm going to stop it. Notice I stopped it at around 2,223. So right now I'm going to stop recording and it allows me to analyze my graph like so. I can actually see the actual position versus the uh, actual value versus the position demand. I go back down to zero once I homed it. And that's how strong this diagnostics trace is. And that concludes our presentation for today. Um, next up, uh, feel free to ask any questions that you may have um, for a little Q&A. Um, just let me know um, if you have any questions. If we don't get to these questions today, feel free to shoot these questions into support at unitronics.com. I would be happy to answer them. And thank you today for uh, attending our webinar. And have a great day. Bye-bye.
Looks like here, thanks for joining. Um, looks like we have a couple of questions here in the box. Um, it looks like one of the questions is configuration of programs similar to the Visualogic software. Uh, the quick answer is yes. Um, it uses the same function block, so the same PLC standard open box that you, that you see. Uh, you put it on the rail just like you would um, in the Unilogic software, so it's uh, very, very similar with Visualogic software as well. Another question here is that the MC function block allowed to monitor the output values for troubleshooting without assigning tags. Yes, those tags will update um, without linking tags. That's why it was given the green option. It's just mostly for your, you know, to add your tag to your application uh, for testing and further development. Very good question. Like uh, pretty much concludes the questions for now. Um, if, of course, if we didn't get to any of the questions, feel free to shoot us a quick, quick, quick uh, email at support at unitronics.com. And once again, my name is Thomas, and it's been a pleasure this morning. I hope you guys enjoyed our webinar. Um, once again, just contact support if you have any questions regarding any application sizing. Uh, we're, we're more than happy to discuss. Um, if you have anything else for us, uh, just shoot us an email. Have a great day.